Here's what's coming up on today's show. We can tell you what we think you should do from just numbers. But if it's not what feels good to you or right. feels right, it's going to help you sleep at night, what you want in your goals, then it's not going to be the advice you want. <laughs> You're not going to be able to follow it. This is the Money Master Podcast from Brindle and Bay Wealth Management with Tori Tenhagen, Connie Davis, and certified financial planner, Nick Davis. All right, welcome back to the Money Master Podcast. This is a book club episode. If you've been following along, we have been going through the book, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. It's been a fantastic book. And Connie, Tori, and myself, we've been reading the book. We've got it all highlighted here, and, and we've heard comments from several people that have enjoyed reading the book, and we've actually been sending this book out to several of our clients throughout the last couple of years. And I've heard good things about it as well. So today we're going to get started talking about chapters 11 through 13. All right, we're all back here. Connie, what, what have you, um, has it been just as good as the other chapters? Well, I would say these, uh, these chapters were a little bit more difficult. They were a little bit more heady, a little bit more in depth. Like I had to read the chapters a little bit slower. However, the first sentence I love, mm -hmm. you're not a spreadsheet. <laughs> you're a person. A screwed up emotional person, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, like, like let's, let's just call it for what it is, right? Like we, we can't live by a spreadsheet. There are ups and downs in our lives. Things happen and we are emotional yeah. people and we make emotional decisions. Even the engineers know that, you know, yeah. they know that they, they want to live lack on the emotional side. I no. know I do as well. <laughs> right. I remember, I don't know if it was a video that I did recently or what, but I was talking about how your assumptions are not going to come to pass, right? Exactly like you put them into your software or your spreadsheet. So a little bit of flexibility is needed and, you know, everything is not completely rational. In fact, the chapter is called reasonable is greater than rational. And, um, you know, Morgan House is a pretty smart guy and math guy. So for him to say, Let's not always be completely rational. You know, we should probably listen. The quote that I took away from this chapter right away was that I think feel like kind of summarized it for me was do not aim to be coldly rational when making financial decisions. Aim to be pretty reasonable. I thought that was great. Yeah. We because we need to balance our emotions like on what we really want with what we also know is smart. Right. So like there's like all these contradictions into know what we know we should do versus what we really want to do. And a um, couple of examples that come to my mind are we recently had a family who they're Texas retirees. They have a daughter who lives in Colorado, but their dream was to build their, their retirement home in Tennessee. And Tennessee is a little bit smarter than Colorado financially because of the state tax being uh, very, very low. They only tax dividends in Tennessee, whereas Colorado is a little bit higher. So mathematically, if we run their plan both ways, Colorado didn't make as much sense, but families there, there's maybe even just the emotional side of what if, what if they like Colorado more than Tennessee, you know, if they can afford that, it should be more of a compromise between their emotional and, and maybe the rational. So he also used examples about renting versus buying, which I thought was pretty good. He talked about sometimes it makes sense to rent instead of buy. Because maybe you're moving around, you know, maybe you don't want to have to do maintenance or you're not you're exactly, traveling a lot or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. The way a mortgage works out, yeah. is that you, if you're going to sell your house within a couple of years anyway, however, buying can maybe give you a sense of ownership. Maybe you can customize that home. And so I see this with mortgages, you know, it's like Tori and I, we always people, the, probably one of the biggest questions we get like all year round is, should I pay off my house? Yeah. Probably most frequent question going into retirement. Yeah. And it's like, well, here's the math, right? The math can go either way. We're not going to talk about it in this episode, but even if the math doesn't make sense, the emotion kind of trumps this, right? Like, do you feel better having your house paid off? You know, if so, we can't change your mind. We're not right. going to try to, but there's a marrying between the reasonable and the rational. Well, and he wrote that. There's a quote on page 115. A doctor's goal is not just to cure disease. It's to cure disease within the confines of what's reasonable and tolerable to the patient. And that comes into financial planning too. We can tell you what we think you should do from just numbers. But if it's not what feels good to you or right. feels right, it's going to help you sleep at night. What you want in your goals, then it's not 
going to be the advice you want. <laughs> You're not going to be able to follow it. Yeah. It makes me think about when, when we visit with families, you know, either in person or virtually, right? We, we view this very much as a partnership in building a financial plan because there are so many emotional things mm-hmm. that come into play. And so yeah. you have to feel good about what yeah. you're I met with someone yesterday and that was part of the conversation was I need to know how you feel about this. Like this is what we're going to recommend, but I need to get your sense of feeling yeah. on this because if I tell you this is what we recommend and then you hate it, yeah. you're not comfortable with it, then you're not gonna we're not going to do it. Anyway. Yeah, you're going to have a problem in a year. We have such biases <clears throat> and you know, I, I've mentioned this a lot, but at Texas Tech, if you want to become a certified financial planner, you go to the human science building. And if you want to become a CFA and be a math person for portfolios, you go to the business uh, building. And there's a distinction between the psychology of money and the math of money. And we, it's very, very much an art to f- marry the, the biases people have. In fact, in the CFP exam, you will be faced with many of the, the of correct answers, but based on the evidence inside of the person's psychology, what they've demonstrated to you, the right answer is based on, you know, more, biases, more of a biased. heuristic, yeah. correct. And so um, here's a quote from the book that made me think of that. People do some crazy things with money, but no one is crazy. People from different generations raised by different parents who earn different incomes and survive different economies have different views about how money works. I mean, think about people who grew up at different time periods and how mm-hmm. they experience money and how it causes them to have a bias, right, towards sure. yeah. certain things. And as financial planners, we're not trying to change people's mind because that's very, very difficult. It's very, very right. hard. Instead, we're trying to identify <laughs> where the goals are, what they want, what their mind, yeah. where their mind is at, right? Yeah. Well, that actually, speaking of that, that came up in one of my meetings yesterday as well. The the couple was, you know, they kind of had differing views and we were talking through, okay, but how does this work together in your plan? What do you want in retirement? And the husband said, I see you're also a marriage counselor. You know, like <laughs> that comes up is like, you've got to work with, because that, yeah. those different childhoods, those different backgrounds can be in a, in a married couple inside one financial plan, right? Like you can have yeah. differing views. It's funny what. that they would say that to you. I've never, <laughs> ever been told that, but you have a degree in psychology. Yeah. So <laughs> evidently you, you get to, you get those accolades. Uh, if it's an accolade to be a marriage yeah. counselor while you're also doing financial, financial planning. planning. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, my takeaway from this chapter is it's more effective to allow yourself to do what feels right than, you know, as well as what is mostly smart, right? Like we want to identify what is smart to do Right. And that's what you want your financial planner for. Hey, this is smart, but you know, a sensible financial planner is also going to realize, well, what are you going to stick to and what, what feels right? It's kind of a subjective thing to say, but what combining that we, you know, with this, what actually feels right. Here's a quick break to tell you about a video I recently finished. The video is called three ways to reduce taxes on your social security benefits. Up to 85% of your social security can be taxed federally. And it's really a form of double taxation because you paid tax on it every year that you contributed. So in this short video, I'm gonna share three ways to reduce or eliminate taxes on your social security benefits. It's no cost to get that video. All you have to do is text us the letters SS to our office line, which is 214-988-9178. And we'll get that right to you. Again, it's text the letters SS, like Social Security, to 214-988-9178. Next chapter, chapter 12. For those of you following along, the chapter is called Surprise. And my quote that I took away at the beginning of this chapter is, the biggest risk is always what no one sees coming. And I guess I have to give you two quotes because I, I found two that I really loved. The second quote from this chapter was, history is the study of surprising events. I thought that was brilliant. And it talks a lot about, the chapter talks about how surprises shaped the world and how those surprises like, you know, made a huge difference in how the world turned out. For example, the Great Depression, World War II, 9-11, 2008. Even we're acting differently today because of the pandemic, right? We're all behaving differently. And um, so there's a book called The The Black Swan. And uh, everybody's afraid of the Black Swan event. And one of the main premises is, is that one thing that we know for certain is that what you don't expect to happen will, will happen. happen. <laughs> I like how this chapter talked about, you know, you mentioned like the Great Depression, 9-11 pandemic. Outlier and, big events. Yes. And we think about 
that specific event, what happened on 9-11. But what we kind of don't tend to think about or we forget are all the ripple effects that happened from that major event that bring us to where we are today. And um, yeah, I mean, I underlined in this book, things that have never happened before happen all the time. Yeah. Right. Like how many times? Yeah, oh, what man, have we lived through 2020 was the unprecedented, like the word of the year. Like yeah. we've lived through unprecedented times yeah. many times. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, this has never happened before, but it's happening right now. <laughs> yeah. And that will happen again. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Another quote from the chapter, the correct lesson to learn from surprises is that the world is surprising. Like that's the correct lesson. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, that would reinforce that there's a need for us to be prepared for the for, unexpected. Yeah. And That's one of our adapt. financial planning principles, right? We right. we can only build a financial plan with some unexpected built in. That's the only way you can plan yeah. because it's not going to go exactly the way it's gone before. Right. We want to, well, we have a thing that we say all the time, which is we want to reduce the amount of surprises, right? Like as much as possible. So let's kind of handle those things. You know, like we know we should have some buffers in there, like have an emergency fund and, and have um, some, some contingency plans, um, some what ifs. So I've got a couple of takeaways, like some practicals from this chapter. Um, one thing that kind of stood out to me is that you, we, sh- we should just get comfortable with surprise. Like nobody is. Nobody wants to be comfortable with it. but yeah. Especially when you're retired, right? Like yeah. that's one of the things that we see in an yeah. I, I don't have time for my money to recover. This is all I've got. Like the surprises almost feel a little bit bigger when yeah. you're planning and, and the way we're planning. I will say that 100% of people <clears throat> though, they do say, they do fear the future and they, they are like, oh my gosh, I know something that's going to, I don't know is going to happen. It's going to happen. And the big one that stands out a lot is healthcare. Like, right. oh my gosh, what about healthcare? What about my health? You know, I was thinking about that. Like we're very blessed and fortunate, right? I'm happily married. I've got four children, uh, love what I do, but you know, you also think I'm going to appreciate this moment because you never know when you, you know, you're going to have a health issue, right? right? So we all are used to living with that, right? There's a stoic practice that I do. And in my office at home, I have a life in weeks calendar. I've talked about it before on videos on YouTube. Um, And it's basically you check off every week and it's like 90 years of weeks. And if you look at like my, my chart, my calendar is like halfway gone. You know, I'm 46 years old. I'm like, Ooh, you know, it's, it helps you to embrace the now, but also to be expecting, you know, what can potentially happen. It's not comfortable. There's no way to sugarcoat it, but it's just the way it is. So what can we do? Get comfortable with surprises as much as possible. Try to reduce surprises by doing good financial planning. In this chapter, Morgan Housel talks about a margin of safety. I was just going to say that when you say get comfortable with, you know, planning for surprises, that's one of the things we tell people all the time. One of our biggest jobs is to manage your mindset, manage your expectations about what might happen. Yeah. Because like he even says it on page 141 of, you know, the, the difference between you might be fine on a spreadsheet, but that's very different than how you feel taking your kids in at night, knowing your investment decisions are okay. Mm. And that's where we're trying to manage the expectations. We can tell you on a spreadsheet, you're okay. Yeah. But if you can't sleep at night, then yeah. we still have an issue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. He gave an example of a Nobel Prize winner who actually discovered the, what's called the efficient frontier in financial planning. It's like the perfect way of doing your portfolio. And he said, like the perfect way of doing it, and this kind of goes back to the reasonable versus rational conversation. Um, perfect way of doing it would be like 100% on the efficient frontier, but his emotions couldn't handle that, even though he knows it's mathematically okay. So he ended up settling on a 50-50 portfolio, 50% stocks, 50% bonds. Ultimately, he ended up moving more towards a 60-40, even a 70-30 over time because he ended up you know, just kind of marrying the reasonable and rational kind of back to that so that he could deal with the surprises that come. So and what we're, this is about margin of safety. It's the same thing in your portfolio. You know, we're not in love with bonds, right? We want to make sure you've got your short-term needs met. We know stocks are going to outpace inflation. You know, they're more, they never have not. They're more likely to. So if it ever didn't, if dividends didn't outpace inflation, then that would be a first. However, we, we also know that we need to have that margin of safety built in, which is why we have bonds in our portfolio, you know, yeah, to, to manage your So people come in here and like, emotions. I hate bonds. We talk to people all the time. Like, I hate bonds. Don't put me in any bonds. I get it. You know, we can go with less bonds for you for sure. Um, but what about that margin of safety and what's going to help you to sleep better at night? That brings me to another point about dealing with surprise. And that would be to diversify. So 
biggest mistake everybody always makes is like basing what they're doing on their last season, like whatever did well last season. So like nobody likes international stock right now because it didn't do as well in the last 10 years. However, according to the book stocks for the long term, if you want to read the most comprehensive book on owning stocks, read stocks for the long term. Um, it's crazy academic, but the most recent version of that book believes that even though international stocks have not done good, eventually our tech sector, which is propping up the U.S. stocks, is going to give way and international may end up being a cyclical thing, right? So that's why we diversify and we own a little bit of everything. And that's what diversification is. And then the last tip from this chapter about avoiding surprises is focusing on uh, long term winning the battle, meaning we want to win. Well, I would say winning the war instead of yeah. winning the battle, right? If there's surprises and, you know, we always want to zoom out and um, focus on winning the big picture, just like saying, well, you know, hey, technology has done really great for me for so long. I just want to keep doing technology. Well, there's, a, there's actually some pretty big periods where you would have lost for 10 years straight, you know, um, so do you really want to do that? Well, let's zoom out and we see, okay, we want to go ahead and be a little more reasonable. So what are your thoughts? What is the takeaway for these chapters in this episode? I mean, I think the biggest takeaway is just plan for the unexpected as much as you can. Know that there's going to be surprises and know that you're going to have to adjust somewhere along the line. At the very, the very end of this chapter on page 146, he says, I save a lot. And I have no idea what I'll use the savings for in the future, <laughs> which, you know, financial planning, you know, we work with people who are yeah. near in retirement, like you've done a good job at accumulating. And the truth is, yes, you know where a lot of those funds are going to be allocated to, but good thing you saved a lot because there's going to be something that comes up. Yeah, there's something, yeah. And, that's, and that's something a lot of people, that's their biggest fear coming in. I know what I want to go travel. I know where I want to go. I know what my big goals are, but I don't know how to plan for the AC going on in my house that I have to pay, you know, this much money for. Or how the, much? Yeah. yeah how or much how much is yeah. it going to cost? Or yeah. when? Yeah. Exactly. And what's going to come up? Or is the stock market going to go down and tank and I'm yep. going to struggle? They're, that's the stuff they're scared about. Yeah. My big takeaway kind of adding to what both of you all said is, you know, the best thing I think we could probably do is ask the question, what could go wrong? Right? Like what could go wrong? And I think most of us as consumers can't properly ask all those questions ourselves. We need a little bit of professional help because we need to know what am I exposed to, you know, especially if you're a fearful person and you're kind of afraid of facing those types of questions. What we have found is that if you face the fears by looking at the what if situations, like what could go wrong, you know, what if social security was reduced, would I be okay? What if healthcare costs a lot more? Would I be okay if it costs me 20% more? Um, what if taxes go up? Big one is what if I'm forced to retire early? Like, could I do that? And we hear that one quite a bit. Yeah. Those are things that you can test. Those are things that if you do want to face those things face on, good financial planners should be able to help you to see what would happen to you if those things happen so that the fear can be reduced and you can feel better about moving forward into your next chapter. Well, we thank you for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed this and took away some, some great info. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider sharing it. Leave us a comment or give us a like. And if you feel like you need help creating or updating your financial plan or have financial questions, you can always reach out through our website at brindleandbay.com. Until next time, take care and keep exploring. Hey, Nick Davis here. You know, we have a vision to create a rewarding, fulfilling retirement journey for every individual. And we do that through creating well thought out financial plans. Now, if you want to create the next chapter experience filled with calmness and clarity for your life, then our team would love to visit with you about that. It all starts with a 15 minute discovery call that you can set up right there on your phone or your computer. All you have to do is click on the Let's Talk button that's on our website, brindleandbay.com. So you'll go to brindleandbay.com and click Let's Talk. Let's get the conversation started with a short phone call. We would welcome an opportunity to meet you.
Nick Davis is an investment advisor representative of Brindle and Bay Financial Advisors, a registered investment advisor. This show is for informational purposes only. Any exposure to ideas and financial vehicles discussed should not be considered financial advice or recommendation to buy or sell a financial vehicle. You should consult a qualified financial, tax, or legal professional before taking any action. This program is not endorsed by the Social Security Administration or any other government agency. Annuity guarantees rely solely on the financial strength and claims paying ability of the issuing company. Insurance licensed in Texas, number 1188639. Brindle and Bay Wealth Management is affiliated with Brindle and Bay Financial Advisors.